Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. So it's really a pleasure to see so many people here. Also, there are many more people online, I heard. Um, so we are here to talk about consciousness. So we all know that consciousness is probably one of the most fundamental, yes, least understood uh, questions in both science and philosophy. And today we have the fortune of having some of the foremost uh, experts in the world about consciousness, ranging from philosophy to neuroscience, from lab-based research to clinical practice. Um, I'll be very brief. So we have asked our speakers to provide a short talk, try to address some questions. What is consciousness? Uh, why is it important to study it? And what remains to be understood about this topic? So we will hear the four speakers today. And after that, we'll have some time for a debate. And there will also be a borrow afterwards. So please remain after the end of the debate. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge some important contributions. The Faculty of Science is supporting us today. Also, Amsterdam Brain and Cognition. And finally, this has happened also thanks to the contribution of the Templeton World Charity Foundation. I also would like to thank uh, all the staff at SPAU25 already, in particular also Barbara Kohlen and uh, Jeske Brauer, and Render Dorman, who also contributed significantly to this event. Um, and I would like uh, to give the floor to the first speaker, Sir Pennert, who will, give a, will talk about the study of consciousness and historical perspective and recent development. Briefly, Cyril is a professor in cognitive and system neuroscience at the University of Amsterdam, where he studies the neuronal mechanism of cognitive functions such as memory, decision making, perception, and of course consciousness. So he proposed a theory of representationalism of consciousness, which is described in some books that he authored, including The Brain's Representational Power and The Code of Annette Bevusain. And please, the floor is to Cyril. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in addition to the people uh, Umberto already mentioned, uh, I'd like to thank also Umberto himself and Angelica da Silva Lancia is also here, uh, who helped a lot with the preparations for the for the Intrepid Grant. Uh, we just had a wonderful meeting here, uh, just around the corner on uh, on this new initiative from the Templeton World Charity Foundation, who sponsors it, and uh, we're very lucky to have uh, indeed some of the. Uh, main specialists in the philosophy of mind and consciousness uh, here, um, who will speak after me. Um, so I'm supposed to talk about a historical perspective and recent developments. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing to attempt it in the face of uh, uh, yeah, main philosophers we have in the room, but um, I'll, I'll try to do my best. Um, yeah, one of the yeah the, the key things is of consciousness is illustrated here. This man has an artificial limp, but he still feels and, and expresses this very much in his behavior, how he feels the cold. Uh, but uh, of course, that can be literally the case. One might wonder, where is this cold feeling happening? Is that located in his artificial foot or in his brain or elsewhere? Also, the rotating snakes here, uh, some of people might not be really sensitive to it, but um, a lot of people are. Uh, where are those illusions happening, really? Is that, um, um, is that uh, yeah, out there? Well, it's not really real, um, so it, it can't be literally happening on the screen if we measure that physically. Um, so is it in our brains? Uh, that's, that's also a possibility. A lot of people, when I asked, uh, subscribe to that. They would say, yeah, it's in my brain, but the hope is that the neurosurgeon would not find rotating snakes in, literally in your brain. So what is happening? It's uh, spooky things. Um, also, this one uh, went viral a couple of years ago, the blue-black dress. Um, so some people see this as, as blue and black, others as white and gold. Um, they're, they're, yeah, just taking the poll, if you raise your hand, if you see it as blue and black, then that's interesting. Yeah, that's indeed usually the majority, but who sees it as white and gold? Still, yeah, it's a minority, but still a lot of people. And then sometimes people can switch, actually. That's who can switch, yeah? Two people. Yeah, I also met somebody who um, who was able to switch, but he couldn't switch back anymore. So it was <laughs> confusing. Um, yeah, why is this the case? Um, uh, foremost, it's an illustration of subjectivity, right? That we apparently do th 
interpret or see things differently. Uh, and that's where we not so much agree. It, it's still a real color that we see, but um, where is this happening? Uh, one aid in understanding these kind of effects has to do with context, that uh, color is often perceived in a context of shadows. Um, and in this case, this, this kind of right-hand lady, if displayed in the dark, would at least helps me to understand a bit what people see when they uh, report uh, white and gold. Um, but there's, there's more to this, because actually we don't need the shadows here, the, the dark context, to, to cause these differences between you. Um, and then on the other hand, we have, uh, and that's very much my, my field, um, sorry, these sounds are horrible, <laughs> but that's, yeah, the brain matter we face, and, and, and somehow those, those two must relate. That, that's basically the, what we call the hard problem of consciousness. So how is it that these neurons with their action potentials and their electrical impulses that flow across the nerve fibers um, do something or get something together that would relate to consciousness. Um, we're going to hear various uh, theories also from our next speakers on this. Um, one classical view is, is dualism, uh, and that is actually known from Descartes. It's, it's a classical position to basically say, well, there there is a mind, there is a soul, uh, but there's also a brain. and. Descartes was far ahead enough uh, as a naturalist also to recognize that the mind had to do with the brain. Um, he, he was actually looking here, he lived here on Kalverstraat at some point, uh, dissecting cadavers and dissecting the brain to look for the spot. And he arrived at the pineal gland, as you might know, because this was an organ that was unitary. And the mind is unitary. It's not divided like the hemispheres are uh, two halves of the brain. Um, but then, yeah, you, you sort of end up with difficulties like if mind and brain are two radically different substances, then how do they communicate? Um, so one is immaterial and the other material. What's, what's the mechanism of communication or interaction? So that ends up to be a big problem. Another approach was taken by Spinoza um, here. And uh, of course, he also um, <clears throat> lived for a long time in Amsterdam, in fact, uh, the, the painting you see here is, is taken, painted very near the Stopera, the, the city hall with the opera house. Um, the canal is uh, abolished, it's, it's been uh, uh, filled, and um, you see Moses and Aaron character. So th this was the place actually where he was excommun excommunicated when he, um, for his radical thinking, was expelled from uh, the Jewish community of Amsterdam. This is actually still a ban that is um, valid today, uh, which is... Yeah, uh, a disgrace. But uh, to get back to the philosophy, um, Spinoza was, was much more in favor of mind and brain being two aspects of the same unitary phenomenon, sort of mind-brain unity that would also extend um, beyond uh, the brain. So um, this, this holds the possibility of that the mind is, is very connected to matter. Um, no matter where the matter is, it doesn't have to be the brain per se. Um, then another stream that became popular more in the age of mechanization was uh, materialism. Um, Jean Lemaitre uh, uh, over here uh, wrote uh, Le Homme Machine. So this is the mechanistic view that, um, for instance, uh, at the time there were mechanical ducts operating that could ingest uh, things and behave on stage uh, a little bit like a duck. Um, and this, this stream has, has, has become very powerful uh, still uh, also today. Uh, we know various forms. Uh, people say, well, the mind, yeah, yeah, let's try to get rid of the mind and explain everything in terms of matter, in terms of physics, uh, or like computer functions, inputs and outputs that yield the right uh, answers, even in uh, yeah, artificial intelligence games like Jeopardy. Um, and this was uh, sort of in line with uh, the stream of the discovery of bioelectricity, how you can evoke reflexes by using electrical current uh, here in Galvani 1780 uh, to be followed up by the more or less behaviorist uh, stream of, uh, of Pavlov, uh, known from the Pavlov reflexes, where uh, the, the focus is very much on inputs and outputs, so not care too much about subjectivity or consciousness, because that cannot be studied anyway. Um, and Skinner was also a champion of, of behaviorism in the sense that they said, well, let's leave the mind brain a bit alone if we can explain the output from the input that is behavior from whatever goes in in terms of stimuli, then uh, we've come a long way. Um, 
Interestingly, around uh, the same time of, of this materialistic thought, uh, there was also Immanuel Kant, um, who's uh, much more saying, well, n taking the knowledge about the senses, he recognized that um, um, we basically uh, inform the brain through our senses of what's going on in the world. So. Uh, there's no escape of that sensory information has to pass across nerves first, optic nerves, etc., before arriving at the brain. So he said, yeah, we indeed rightly considering objects of sense as mere appearances, confess thereby that they are based upon a thing in itself, the ding an sich, that we know not this thing as in itself. So we, we have no direct access to the material objects out there, uh, but only know its appearances. So in, in a way, it's, he's already hinting at that we sort of live in a virtual reality, um, namely the way in which our senses are affected by this unknown something. So he recognizes that there must be an external world with objects. However, we don't see that directly. And it's being followed up actually by um, another famous scientist who also um, worked in Königsbergen in Prussia, uh, Hermann von Helmholtz, who followed this up in a much more physiological sense and who also said, well, we, we make inferences about what's going on. We're dependent on our senses. And he talked very much about unconscious inference, but later on we'll hear more about the consciousness. So it's, it has to do with inferences, with estimates based on shadowy information. And uh, you see that the brown and the orange uh, squares are basically uh, having the same wavelength that they emit, but we see a different color. And that was um, a phase also followed up by, by anatomy, by anatomical discoveries, like in the Japanese-Russian War of 1904. Um, uh, yeah, more advanced bullets were being used, and they caused more specific wounds, actually, to the brain, gunshot wounds uh, that passed through the brain, but sometimes also hit uh, very specific areas so that blindness was caused, and thus came uh, the anatomical search for uh, neural substrates having to do with conscious vision, uh, such as this mapping of uh, facial cortex in the monkey, where uh, the small red area called MT, if you damage it, people cannot see motion uh, consciously. So it's motion blindness, but the other aspects of vision are still there, are still intact, like shape perception, uh, etc. cetera. Um, whereas another area, more infrotemporal, more uh, closer bit to the ear, uh, cause form blindness, so visual agnosia. And, um, and so this, this began the parcellation of the cortex in particular, but also the thalamus underneath to, uh, to couple aspects of consciousness, of, of vision in this case, to, um, to the neural substrate. Um, well, it's, it's sort of a long jump uh, towards today, but today, uh, like I said, we have uh, uh, an assembly of participants in this um, consortium that uh, happened to gather in Amsterdam, and um, happy to introduce also uh, Melanie Bolli, who will speak next. Um, it's basically a consortium where theories are being tested, uh, three in number, uh, one led by Carl Friston, active inference, uh, basically, uh, as, as will be explained, um, uh, takes a lot of value from, from actions uh, as, as determining what we're conscious of. Uh, Giulio Tononi um, uh, represents the IIT theory. It's about integrated information. I myself have um, a position called neurorepresentationalism. And these theories are tested against each other um, by the experimental leads. Uh, Lars Mukli is also here today. Umberto Alcese, Jakob Hoey, and, and Neil Set, who will also speak on behalf of the advisory board and steering committee with Andy Clark also on the uh, advisory board. Um, so we, I think we have a great uh, group of speakers here. Um, very briefly, I don't know if we have time for it, but uh, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, the, the idea is it's quite unique actually that uh, people get together who have different theories, but they have to sort out where do the theories really differ and can we make experiments happen that test these uh, differential predictions? Uh, and that's one way to advance because, yeah, you know, there are a lot of theories out there. Uh, there's some pruning needed, but it could also be that theories can be merged or fused together. Maybe theories talk about totally different concepts of consciousness. <clears throat> so Giulio basically says, and I think we'll hear more from Melanie Boilly on this, that consciousness is based on the integration of information, which has to do with the fact that you need structures that elements that are active and connect to each other, uh, but also are differentiated because our conscious experience is 
characterized as something very specific. It's differentiated from all other experiences, but it's also highly unified in the sense that we have only one experience at once. So everything in there belongs together. Um, the other position being uh, defended uh, is called Friston's um, active inference. That more has to do with the notion of seeing as looking. So undertaking actions, motor actions is important. And he describes how basically our internal states in, in the mind, in, in the brain, in the agent, are dependent on uh, yeah, the, the feeding of uh, sensory information, sensations, um, but there are also um, uh, motor predictions being made, and the motor predictions uh, lead to actions that, that alter basically the sensory world, the external states of the world, and thereby cause new uh, sensory information to become available that can be taken into account to, to optimize an organism's predictions. And that is also borne out by eye movements, for instance. We scan the environment, gain thereby new pieces of information, and that um, coheres together into conscious percepts. Um, I myself um, um, are defending the position that consciousness um, yeah, has to do with predictions indeed, um, uh, but also uh, serves to, basically has the function in biology to, to create a survey that we have that helps us in making complex decisions. Uh, so that conscious experience is something like um, a, a multi-level representation across many of these smaller hypotheses or predictions that the brain builds um, that result in, in this multimodal overview, an overview in multiple senses. It's not only what you see, but also how you're positioned, what you feel, um, and that coheres into a conscious percept. <clears throat> So yeah, uh, functionality is, um, now I, I think I'll, I'll skip this slide, it's, it's too long, but um, it basically has to do with the frog's brain that, you know, well, the frog is, is able to uh, react to very simple stimuli, like very simple displays on this iPhone, artificial end, and it, it tries, you know, it's this quick reflex, um, but the, the frog has really no notion of context here, so that he's being fooled or that the thing is just a flat display. Um, and then the, uh, the 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 boy who um, ah yeah <laughs> uh, he's he's called back he's uh, he's uh, terribly uh, surprised um, yeah you know it's also a discussion that uh, has many ramifications in society of course uh, patients that might be conscious or not I think Melanie will talk about it panpsychism so to what extent does consciousness extend to other organisms besides us or even or inorganic matter like stones so watch this the question for you is which object is more likely to have some awareness and the dog is given a uh, a game here where he can earn foods, there's one food pellet earned as he was been trained, but now... <laughs> so, yeah, makes a very deliberate decision of where most of the value lies and what he uh, really has to decide upon. Uh, so there I close. Um, it's, uh, I think, yeah, just for final remarks, um, we do see this historical development from the philosophy of mind to a gradually more neuroscience, brain-based theories of consciousness. So it's becoming, uh, one could say, more concrete to, to test these uh, theories and are, are now and also against each other. And uh, we, we see the importance, I think, back in the work on patients, the work on what consciousness is in patients that do not have very much behavior anymore. Uh, the discussion extends to artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, there's a shameless uh, advertisement of, of these two books, one in Dutch and one in English, if you care. And um, yeah, I'd like to leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Cyril. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end of all the talks. So please keep your questions. Um, our next speaker is uh, Andy Clark. Andy Clark is a professor of cognitive philosophy from the University of Sussex in the UK. He's a leading scholar in the philosophy of mind, and perhaps is most famous for his uh, hypothesis on the extended mind, but he won't talk about that today. And in which, according to which uh, the mind is not bound by the organism, but actually extends in the environment. But today we will hear his stance on consciousness, actually. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So fabulous. Can I see what I'm doing? Yes. What's going to happen? 
be that. No, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Good. So, so thanks to the organisers. This is a, a great event. I'm going to um, try and say far too much in um, 15 minutes, but I'll have a go anyway. Um, so this is about consciousness. Uh, what's the puzzle of consciousness? I think that there is a real puzzle there, but we've got a few clues. I'll look at a couple of those. And then, if there's time, I'll try and do a little twist on that that suggests that maybe um, we might be making a few conceptual errors that make it seem even more complex than it really is. So that's the, that's the plan. So here's Jerry Fodor, philosopher of mind. We don't know, even to a first glimmer, how a brain or anything else that is physical could manage to be a locus of conscious experience. This is surely among the ultimate metaphysical mysteries. Don't bet on anybody ever solving it. So that wasn't too optimistic. Um, here's Dave Chalmers. Many people here know Dave, I think. Also not optimistic yet, but um, kind of thinks that we might get there in the end. No one knows why physical processes are accompanied by conscious experience. Why is it that when our brains process light of a certain wavelength, we have an experience of deep purple? And in fact, why do we have any experience at all? So they're the kind of two main questions that people have around here. You know, why any experience at all? And why, given that you have experience, is it like this rather than like that? So this is a question that philosophers have, have christened with the um, rather nasty name of qualia and the hard problem. So the puzzle is about experiences, the way things are to you, that, the particular way that hunger and thirst feel, the way things look, taste and feel, the smell of the curry, the way that fabric feels. Um, so it's about, it's about subjective experience in that sense of the qualities of experience. That at least seems to be the thing that people get most puzzled by. If I built a robot that smiles when it meets you and it says, have a nice day, we wouldn't have thereby built a happy robot. If we built a machine that could recognize melons by their chemical odors, we wouldn't thereby have built a machine that experiences smell at all. Um, but it might come across a melon and say, OK, yeah, that's a melon. So what's the difference? What's the added ingredient or ingredients? Notice that doing brain science is probably not, well, it depends how you do it, I guess. But just knowing the input-output profile of all the neurons in your brain, that wouldn't be enough. You could have a full account of all the energy flows into and out of the brain and still be rather puzzled by all of those things. So it seems like you need a, you need a pitch at a different level of explanation somehow. Um, understanding, going back to the, the frog, <laughs> understanding how a frog's visual system enables it to detect and catch a moving fly, that's important, it's difficult, but it belongs to what Dave Chalmers calls the class of easy problems. Doesn't mean they're easy, but it just means that you can kind of you can see in principle how they might be solved. You can see that if you did enough science of the kind we already know about, you might well understand that. And in fact, I think we already do. So at that point, you would know, you know, this is how frog vision works. This is how it connects to action. There it is, vision action loop complete. But did the frog feel anything? Did it see anything? You know, I'm frog friendly. I think, yeah, pretty much for sure. But, um, but how do we know and how do we explain it? So. Um, Unlike Fodor, Chalmers and others, I'm kind of optimistic because I think what we've got here is a scientific puzzle, not really a metaphysical mystery. And I think it's a scientific puzzle that looks a little bit more puzzling than maybe it really is. So some clues. Let's go through some clues. Um, first clue, um, I think there's increasing evidence that amongst the things that brains are, brains are prediction machines. One of the things that brains do is um, they they do a kind of informed guessing about what's out there. That's what was coming from Helmholtz in the um, in serial slides. So the idea there is that you know stuff about the world. You've got sort of traces of your previous encounters with the world. And those traces make a difference when sensory stuff comes in. And basically, the brain's taking a guess about what's out there. So here's an example, the hollow face illusion. I didn't bring a physical one along, but I could have. Um, so if you take a, 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 an ordinary mask, like the Charlie Chaplin mask there, and then you rotate it, so it's the concave side of the mask that is facing you, and you light it from behind, and you retire to about three or four foot away, get all of that right, it will look to you as if that's actually a convex side. It will look to you as if there's a, a face with a nose sticking out pointing towards you. Um, there's a, a beyond 
Bjorg version of the same mask. So the idea there is that strong, unconscious prediction, we've we got a lot of face experience, we know they tend to be convex, they overwhelmingly tend to be convex, noses overwhelmingly tend to stick out. Um, that's actually kind of trumping some real sensory information that you're getting, that your brain is getting real sensory information that specifies concavity, but it's kind of saying, no, nah, that's just noise, I know better in this instance. Um, so I think this is quite a big clue. It shows how the brain's predictions damp some bits of the actual sensory signal that's coming in, and they enhance other bits. And I think they're doing that in a way that reveals what matters to creatures like us. You know, faces matter to creatures like us, and we'll come back to mattering later. So predictive processing, this sort of story about brains as prediction machines, is on the right track then that's what brains are doing all the time. It's not just in ecologically odd or unusual circumstances. Um, to the extent that's true, predictions are shaping your experience. And, and that seems, I think, I think it's intuitively true. If I show you this picture, a lot of you might not know what you're seeing. If I now show you the original picture, and I now show you that picture again, your experience is fundamentally different. In fact, you will never again have the experience you had the first time I showed you that. That's, uh, that's your, your kind of shot at that. Now, every time you see that, you see it with a, a prediction in place which makes sense of that sensory jumble in a way, and something jumps out at you. And there are other examples we could have used, sine wave speech, things that uh, might take a bit longer and uh, are a little bit more technically, um, technically likely to go wrong. <laughs> so <clears throat> here we go. So that was one clue. Second clue, I think that these predictions involve a lot of bodily information. Um, when we detect what's out there in the world, we're not just guessing what's out there, we're kind of guessing what's out there in a way that is busily attentive to what's going on inside our own bodies. I think there's a real clue here as to what's going on when animals are, are sentient creatures encountering their worlds. We're mostly unaware that this is going on, but there are good experiments that show that it is. Here's one. Um, if you're given false cardiac information, you might wear a you might wear a watch that can give you a kind of buzz or something like that, and it sort of it buzzes faster than your heart's actually beating, gives you a sort of a false signal that maybe your heart is beating faster. Under those conditions, if you're showing a face image that would normally be considered by you to be neutral, you might find it threatening or aggressive or worrying. So that's kind of interesting. You know, these, inter these bodily signals are making a difference to how you perceive the external world. That's the second clue. <laughs> Third, final clue. All of this stuff is future-oriented, and it's, I think, in the service of action. So now we've got to really think about what embodied biological organisms are all about. There seem to be about two things. One of them is, um, one of them is keeping their bodily states in the right place, so they really care about that. And the other thing is getting actions right. Actions are another way of keeping your bodily states in the right place. The frog's trying to get, you know, fly stuff inside it. So brains don't just predict any old thing they can. These are um, ibex sheep climbing the side of a, a rather sheer damn wall. Damn wall's kind of like that. Um, what they're doing, in a way, is they're kind of harvesting stuff from the world in a way that is trying to anticipate future needs. So the reason that they're going up the dam wall is because lots of salt gets left on the dam wall. And so by going up there, they can get the salt that, in fact, their brains estimate they're going to need in future. They're not going up, they're not waiting till they need lots of salt and then going up to get it. And it's the same when you feel thirst and hunger. Um, you feel thirsty long before you really need to drink, and then you take a drink of water, you immediately feel less thirsty. But actually, it's taken about 20 minutes for that water to do you any good. So both the the feeling of thirst and the feeling of having quenched your thirst are predictive, they're anticipatory. So I think there's a big clue there, and Lisa Feldman Barrett's book, How Emotions Are Made, is, is wonderful on that stuff. So, yes, in fact, that's Lisa Feldman Barrett saying the thing about water. Yeah. Okay, so putting all that together, the three clues, and then there'll be the twist, and then I'll stop. <laughs> so putting all that together, what we think think that we see and what we touch and what we feel is kind of, I think, the result of this process of guessing. This is where Helmholtz was coming from. This is what the, the kind of um, 
predictive process and, act, and active inference bits of the equation that Serial was um, putting up at the end are, are looking at. The idea is that, in a way, perceptual experience is the result of a kind of inference. We're kind of guessing what's out there, taking bodily information and worldly information into account, and we're doing it in the service of stuff that matters to animals like us. And I think that last bit really is important. You know. So what I think you've got there is a theory of basic sentience. I think that's what it is for a frog or a, or a cat or us, for that matter, to be a sentient creature. It encounters a world which is sort of structured in a way that is, is kind of speaking to its needs. I encounter opportunities to get flies, to get salt, stuff like that. So beings like that encounter their worlds as a sort of landscape, uh, a sort of valence landscape, something full of threats and opportunities. It's a world in which what you do matters. So, OK, so that's sentience, I think. And then the question will be, so what about qualia? You know, if that's just sentience, was that all there was to the story? And deep down, I think that is all there is. Uh, and that's the last thing that I'm going to try and argue. So there's, there is a sort of twist here. You might say, OK, um, you could buy all of that and still think that the hard puzzles are completely untouched. But I think that's because we humans are prone to a kind of illusion of something extra to explain. I think once you've done that job on the frog and the, the worm and the dog and us, that was it. You've done all the hard stuff. So we're advanced, intelligent social beings. We're trying to predict our own responses and those of other agents. And to do that, we need a model of ourselves and, you know, the things that we need to predict. Um, predators, prey, and so on. But there's been no evolutionary pressure on us to actually know how we're performing the calculations that enable us to do these things. Just like we don't know how our visual systems crunch differential equations. We don't know about the hidden inferences that are involved when I kind of see, um, I don't know, when I see a threatening face out there. So it turns out, though, that we can predict ourselves and others using a really simple model, one that says, Objects and events cause us to have mysterious experiences and they cause actions. So I explain my response to that neutral face by saying, hey, it just looks scary, but I don't know anything about what's going on in me that is enabling that judgment. I explain my eating by saying I felt hungry and I use the same general model to explain what you do when you approach food. And so we slowly populate our model, I think of ourselves and our worlds, with all these mysterious qualia, states that, bring about distinctive effects in virtue of how they look, feel, taste, and so on. So we basically infer that we're home to mysterious qualia as a simple way of predicting and explaining our own and others' behaviours. That at least is, I mean, I know that's highly contentious. It's something that, you know, maybe only me and Dan Dennett and Keith Frankish believe, but it's what we believe. <laughs> so I think that we actually find this hard to buy because we've got one intuition about consciousness that we shouldn't have, and this is the last thing that I'll, I'll say. We've got a sort of all-or-nothing intuition about consciousness. We think that either a creature has it or they don't. And so we ask really impossible questions about worms, for example. You know, is that really conscious or isn't it? Um, or the fly. If you put that, if you cast that back in terms of the clues that we've been given so far, and I'm sure there are lots more, then you're asking something like this, just how rich, complex, body-involving and forward-looking does an inner predictive model need to be to really and truly support conscious qualitative experience? And that's a question that I think we need to reject. I think it's a bad question because conscious experience is just our name for this whole mosaic of um, skills and tools and features, this whole mosaic of adaptations, if you like. And the parts of that mosaic can come apart and be combined in lots of different ways. So we've seen some bits of the consciousness mosaic, and I'm nearly done. <laughs> um, one is the characteristic contents of an animal's predictive model, the ones that serve its action landscape. Another is the amount of bodily information that it takes into account. Another that I haven't said much about is how far it looks ahead to future events. Can it explore alternate possibilities in imagination? Um, does it deploy the, a simple self-model to predict its own and others' behaviours? I think they're all important aspects of our conscious experience, but I don't think that um, a worm, for example, necessarily deploys a simplified self-model, but I don't think that's a problem because the worms are sentient um, given the other ways that the bodily information is kind of directing the prediction machinery um, works. 
So our consciousness reflects rich processing along all those dimensions, um, but there's no clean line relative to which I think we can say that one living organization, the frog, is really home to qualitative experience, while another one, maybe the worm, isn't. I want to resist that question. Conclusion, asking about the presence or absence of qualia might be a big mistake. Sentience is real, and there's lots of it about, but philosophers' qualia are a kind of bad idea, and I think they're a bad idea constructed by our own kind of oversimplified self-model. And uh, I knew I'd be trying to say too much. These are some of my collaborators on, on a project that was looking at this, and, uh, and thank you. Thanks a lot, Andy. Thanks again. Um, our next speaker is uh, also from the University of Sussex. Anil Seth is a professor in, uh, is a neurologist and uh, professor in cognitive constitution neuroscience. And uh, he focuses on trying to understand the biological basis of consciousness. So we are moving more from philosophy now to neuroscience. And he combines several disciplines. That's a key feature of his approach. Neuroscience, mathematics, computer science, psychology, philosophy, and a lot more. And he's also the author of several books, including a recent one, uh, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Andrew. Can you hear me? Sorry, I just need a minute to set up. Um, I should never have agreed to go after Andy Clark in the room <laughs> to give this talk, is what I was just thinking then. Uh, because he and I, well, he was my thesis examiner. Can you believe it? Which is, that's one reason to avoid doing that. But the main reason is I think we, we agree on, on quite a lot, but not on everything. So, oops, so, exercise for all of you is you get one point when you spot things that we, we've said which are the same, but you get extra special bonus points when you spot where we disagree. And I think there are going to be like a couple, in my thinking, maybe we'll discuss this in the panel, there's one place where I think he goes much further than me, and one place where I go further than him. And of course, they're going to be different places. I hope. If they're the same place, then we're in trouble. Right, let's see if this is going to work. But I'm going to talk about something else as well. So I'm going to give my version of what Andy beautifully, um, oops, beautifully described. And then uh, I'm going to talk about a new project, which, uh, which will diverge a little bit. OK, right, here we go. Conti that's actually, that's the whole talk. It's just all there in that, in that slide. But we don't really have time to look at that for too long. So consciousness, right. My definition of consciousness, we've all got our own definitions. I like this one from Thomas Nagel. It's very simple. Thomas Nagel philosopher. He says, an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something it is like to be that organism. So maybe a point of disagreement already, because Andy thinks this is the wrong question to ask, right, about a frog. But Nagel wrote this very famous paper, you know, what is it like to be a bat? And the idea is it feels like something to be me. It feels like something to be each of you. It doesn't feel like anything to be this, this piece of wood or this controller, but it feels like something to be a bat, maybe, or a frog. We've had a lot of frogs. Um, that's the question. For these systems, for a conscious system, there is something going on. Uh, I like this definition because it doesn't include a lot of things that often people confuse with consciousness. It doesn't include intelligence. It doesn't include language. It doesn't include an explicit sense of self-identity. So consciousness is not the same as any of these things. It is just the presence of raw experience. Another point, image of David Chalmers. They're looking a little bit more haggard in this picture than in the one that, that Andy had. Um, but a very similar quote. So this is the problem of consciousness and, and Chalmers. I'll read out it again just for repetition, for emphasis. It is widely agreed that, that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. That's the hard problem. How and why should physical systems processing within them, generate or be identical to any kind of experience. Now, you can try and tackle this hard problem head on. Some of the theories that, that Cyril mentioned at the beginning, and Melanie Body will talk about, do try to do this. But my approach is a bit different. I call it mainly to annoy Dave Chalmers, I call it the real problem of consciousness. And the real problem of consciousness is just kind of subtly different. It's, it's saying, well, I'll 
Right at first, it says, how can mechanisms and processes in the brain and the body explain, predict, and control properties of consciousness, functional and phenomenological? Now, it's a bit wordy, but the basic idea is to accept that consciousness exists. You know, it's a real thing, like we are all conscious. Um, the illusionism that, that Andy mentioned, if you take, if you, it's like a, a medicine. If you take too much of it, you can end up trying to, you know, you persuade yourself that consciousness doesn't exist at all. Can you all hear me? Do I need this? I do. Oh, for the stream, of course. All right, sorry about that. Yeah, I tend to wander around. I forgot about that. Never mind. Um, so if you take, yeah, illusionism, if you take too much of it, then you tend to like, go around saying silly things like consciousness doesn't exist at all. Maybe if you take just the right amount, you come up with a very sensible perspective that it's not the mystery that we thought it was. Um, but consciousness exists, but instead of trying to explain the how and why head on, just try and explain, predict, and control its various properties in terms of things happening in brains and bodies. Like, why do experiences have the character that they have? Why is my visual experience different from my auditory experience? And so on. Um, critically, these properties that one might try to explain are not only the functions, like what I can do because I'm conscious, like plan ahead or tell jokes, but... Um, the properties of the experience themselves, like the, the spatial, colourful character of vision compared to the, the experience of emotions, which are like good or bad. Now, this is neither the hard problem because it's not trying to say why and how consciousness is part of the universe. It's not the easy problem either because it's not just about saying how brains perform functions. It, it's what a lot of us do anyway, and it's not a new idea. There's this whole tradition of neurophenomenology, which is all about mapping neural processes onto brain dynamics. So it's just a different take on that approach, really. But the hope is, or like my hope, in, in following this, in doing this hard work of accounting for particular conscious experiences in terms of particular mechanisms, is that we end up not solving the hard problem, but dissolving it. So it no longer seems to be the problem that once it did. And there are some interesting parallels to this in the history of science. It wasn't that long ago that life seemed very mysterious to physicists and chemists and the nascent biologists of the day. The whole philosophy of vitalism held that you could not, just could not explain the difference between the living and the non-living in terms of physics and chemistry. There had to be something else, the spark of life. The hard problem of life, though, it wasn't solved by someone finding the spark of life or deciding that life doesn't exist. Right? It was by recognizing that life isn't one big scary mystery. It has many properties, and you can get on with the business of explaining each of those properties, and then the hard problem of life dissolves. Now, the hope, not the promise, but the hope is the same strategy will hold for consciousness. Get a, get far enough with the real problem, and maybe the hard problem will dissolve in a puff of metaphysical smoke. Now, they're not identical. One of the big challenges of consciousness is, of course, that we very difficult to get objective data about it. Like, you can put a frog, back to frogs, you can put a frog on a table and agree what happens when you squash it, right? That's biological data. But you can't do the same with a conscious experience. You cannot put a conscious experience on a table and all look at it. Some people think this is a fundamental objection to getting a scientific explanation of consciousness. I don't think it is. I think it just makes the data more challenging to acquire. That's all. It's just a, a complication. So anyway, that's the strategy. And to return to the parallel with life, if we divide life up into different properties, well, what are the different characteristics of consciousness that we might say? The equivalent of things like metabolism, reproduction, homeostasis, all these things that living systems have and do. There are many ways to cut this cake, and I prefer to oops I prefer to cut it this way. This isn't here are three ways of thinking about consciousness. Now they're not completely separate. It's a bit just practical to do it this way. There's conscious level. So we, we lose consciousness when we go into a dreamless sleep or go under general anesthesia and it returns when we come round or wake up. That's level. Then there's content. When we are conscious, we're conscious of something. The people, places, objects, shapes, colors, smells that populate the world that we experience around us. And then within all that, there's conscious self. The experience of being you or being me, of being an individual. So I won't talk about level at all today, but I'll talk a little bit about content and self. And uh, we'll start with content. Another point for those of you playing the Andy Clark, Anil Seth bingo. Your brain is a prediction machine. This is the principle that underlines 
all of what I'm going to talk about. So there is a lot of similarity here. This is the idea. Andy has already explained it, and, and Cyril, actually, very nicely. But here's my version. Imagine that you are a brain. You're your brain. You're there. You're locked inside this bony vault of a skull, trying to figure out what's out there in the world. And you have no direct access to what's in the world. All you get are these noisy and ambiguous electrical signals, which just only indirectly to related to, to things that are actually out there. Oops. So... Um, the brain, trying to make sense of these signals, has to combine these noisy and uncertain signals with prior expectations, prior beliefs about the way the world is. And by combining these prior beliefs with the sensory data, the brain can make an informed guess, a best guess, about the causes of the sensory signals. And the claim here is that's what we experience. We don't read out sensory signals. The brain is continually generating its predictions about the way the world is, and that's what we experience. Under the hood, this is, a way, this is a way of saying the brain is doing Bayesian inference on the causes of sensory signals in the world by updating predictions. Now, I'll give you another demonstration of this kind of thing. We've seen a few of these from Andy. Fortunately, this is a different one. I had to do some slight shy, slide reshuffling while he was speaking, get the hollow face out of the way. Um, this is called Adelson's Checkerboard. How many people have seen this one? A few, but not everybody. Okay, there's still a little mileage in it yet then. So these patches A and B, they should look different shades of grey, right? Yes. Do they look different shades of grey? Yes. Okay, but they, are they different shades of grey? No, they are not. They're the same shade of grey as you can see if I join them up, move it along, and they really are the same shade of grey. Take the bar away and they look different again. So what's happening here, it's a really nice demonstration that, you know, deep within your brain, there is baked in the knowledge that objects under shadow appear darker than they are. And it's in virtue of that prior belief about the structure of the world that makes us see B as lighter than it really is. So your expectations here are really shaping the way you experience things. Now, there's any number of demonstrations of this sort. That, that, we could, that I could give, but I want to move on to just say this changes the way we think about perception from this kind of classical picture that the brain reads out sensory information from the world in this outside-in, bottom-up direction to this new picture, um, which is a version of predictive coding, predictive processing, very popular idea that Andy and, and Jakob Hoppe have really pioneered in the philosophy of mind, that it's not just that the brain reads out sensory signals, but the, the sensory signals serve as prediction errors uh, that, that help the brain update its predictions at every moment, at every day, of all the time, and that what we perceive is the content of these top-down predictions. We, we don't passively perceive the world in this view. We actively generate it. And again, there are some demonstrations of, of this process in everyday life, not just in illusions. When you, you look up in the sky on a cloudy day, you might see faces in clouds, right? We all have this experience now and again of seeing patterns in things called pareidolia. Uh, what's happening here is you're seeing kind of the echo of the brain's predictions about faces in situations where there are no real faces. Faces are very, very important things for human beings to, to recognize and identify in the world. So we, the brain is continually like reaching out with this prediction of face to see where it can find any grip. And sometimes it finds grips in weird places. Uh, we actually, a few years ago, did a sort of fun virtual reality simulation of this by taking a neural network and um, fixing the output so that it said dog and changing every frame of the input and sort of putting it in a VR headset and strapping people into the VR headset for hours so they had this weird uh, trip. Um, but what you, what's interesting here is it's not just like dogs being photoshopped onto a movie, right? The dogs seem to come out of the movie in some weird organic way. It's really a model, a computational model, of a different kind of experience. And what we're doing now is taking this work on a bit to try and model specific kinds of hallucinations that people have in dementia, in Parkinson's disease, in, in uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome, and all sorts of things. So, um, oh, by the way, that was Sussex campus. So if you want to come and visit, that's what it's like. So in this view, then, you can, you can call hallucination as a kind of uncontrolled perception where the brain's best guesses lose their grip on reality. But, as Andy said, this is going on all the time. It's not just a quirk. It's, it's under the hood. We just don't recognize it as being going on all the time. Perception in the here and now is, in this, this view, a kind of controlled hallucination in which the brain's predictions are always reined in by what's going on out there in the world. 
Now, the second bit and the last bit is just this applies to the self too, the experience of being a self. The self is not the thing that does the perceiving. The self is a kind of perception. And there are many ways in which we experience being a self. Various listed here. You know, we experience being a body. We have a first-person perspective. We experience being the cause of actions. These are all different ways in which we experience being who we are. They can all come apart in psychiatry, in neurology, and in the lab. I've just mentioned the experience of the body. This is a very key aspect of how we experience selfhood. The idea is the same. The brain is continually making predictions about, in this case, what object in the world is my body and what is not. And the content of that prediction, that's our experience of the body as part of the self. One beautiful demonstration of this is the rubber hand illusion. Probably you've all seen the rubber hand illusion. You can put somebody, hide their real hand behind a screen, give them a fake hand, stroke the fake hand and the real hand at the same time. And for most people, they develop this kind of uncanny sensation that that fake hand is in somehow related part of their body, maybe. Not really, but maybe a little bit. Uh, what this shows is that something we normally take for granted, this, this thing is my body, can be quite easily altered. Very simple manipulation, and you can change that experience. Now, there's a lot of argument about what is actually going on to do that. The classic story is it's to do with the brain putting together different kinds of sensory information. Uh, but we thought at Sussex it might be something else. So my colleague Pete Lush did this incredibly ambitious experiment. He did the rubber hand illusion on 450 people. He had this like, rubber hand factory going on for a week and um, correlated it with how hypnotizable people are. Uh, we're all hypnotizable to different degrees. It's a very stable psychological trait. One minute, I've got two minutes I have according to this. Um, and it correlates very strongly. So the idea here is the rubber hand illusion might be some kind of suggestion effect going on. Now, to finish, there's a difference between having a body and being a body. And he talks about being a body. There's interoception, which is this perception of the body from within. And again, the same story applies. It's about prediction and prediction error. I've called this for many years now interoceptive inference. And there's a key difference here, though, which is that predictions about the body from the inside aren't about finding out what's there. They're about controlling and regulating the body, keeping the body alive, keeping it going. And if you think about it, that might explain why things like emotions feel the way they do. You know, they feel the, so visual predictions underpin visual experience because they're about where things are. Are they moving towards me or are they going away and so on? So visual experiences have that kind of character. Emotional experiences, embodied experiences, are about how good a job the brain is keep doing at keeping the body alive. So these experiences have the character of being good or bad or variations on that theme. And different kinds of predictions, different kinds of experiences. Now, the larger message of this, I think, is that consciousness, if, if, this is, if these predictions are the mechanisms that underlie all our conscious experience, then you can imagine them having a basis really in our nature as living flesh and blood creatures. The real strong claim here is that consciousness is very, very closely tied to life because the predictive mechanisms that underlie all our experiences have their origin evolutionarily, developmentally, and in the day-to-day -day in the prediction and the regulation of our messy flesh and blood materiality. So Descartes, got to bash Descartes a little bit, especially since we're near where he used to live, was very keen to draw a distinction between life and consciousness or rational mind. He said about other animals, he said, without minds to direct their bodily movements, animals must be regarded as unthinking, unfeeling machines that move like clockwork. So living, being living alive doesn't really matter for conscious mind. Now, I think exactly the opposite that we perceive the world and the self with, through, and because of our living bodies. We are conscious beast machines. I will finish with a couple of very quick implications. One of them is that we all have different brains, so we all see things differently. We don't see things as they are, as Anais Nin said. We see them as we are. Just as we differ on the outside, we differ on the inside too. The dress, it actually is blue and black. The real dress is blue and black, for those of you who didn't know that, is one good example of that. But that kind of flared up in social media and then disappeared. And I'm going to finish with a call to action for everybody, which is we have a new project at Sussex where we really want to measure how different our inner worlds are. When they're extremely different, it's easy to notice because people start saying, oh, I see a, you know, I see a tiger and there's no tiger. But what about in the normal range? Just as people can differ slightly in height, maybe we differ slightly in how we experience sound, music, emotion, vision, color. 
Very little is known about this hidden landscape of inner diversity. And so we have this new study called the Perception Census, uh, which is trying to change all that. So there's a series of um, like 10 sections. Each takes about 20 minutes. And we look at different uh, aspects of perception, color, time, emotion, expectations, and so on. And we're trying to get as many people to take, pos take part as possible. We've got about 10,000 already, but we really want to get 10 times that. So if you would love to, if you would help, if you would like to help us by doing the perception census, that would be absolutely amazing. Here are some of the things we're looking at. You can ask questions, and we'll try to answer them. Uh, here's the link again. And it all came from this weird project where we gave 35,000 people visual hallucinations, which I don't want to talk about. That's, that's something for another day. Uh, here's the book. It's available. One minute walk away. How about that? There's a bunch of signed copies very, very close by. Thank you for your attention. is uh, Melanie Bolli. Uh, she's a neurologist and neuroscientist from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She focuses on altered states of consciousness, for instance, sleep, anesthesia, vegetative states, or minimally conscious states, all these disturbances. And her work is mainly grounded in a theoretical framework which we've heard about, which is the integrated information theory. So please, Melanie. Thank you, Umberto, and thank you, Sergei, for having us here. I'm delighted to have the chance to talk, although I have the impossible task of replacing Dr. Wolf Singer, so sorry, you have me instead today. Uh, I'll take a different tack from uh, my uh, previous colleagues because I'm going to mostly talk about data here and the clinical implications of the science of consciousness, which are very dear to me because I'm a neurologist and I see patients all the time and I work, as Umber just said, with this kind of clinical data for a while now. So basically, you know, um, the science of consciousness has many implications for understanding who we are and also like how we perceive the world, how different and similar we are. But also, it has very, implication, uh, very important implications in trying to understand uh, the mechanisms of loss of consciousness and also how to diagnose and treat patients with these disorders. So I did my PhD with Stephen Norris, and you know, he classically distinguishes between you know, these two components in the clinical exam of consciousness. We actually look at the arousal, having eyes open, and also signs of consciousness and typically arousal and awareness go together like if you fall asleep the deeper the sleep the less consciousness you have and the less arousal too same thing for coma or anesthesia but there are these, these states these disorders where you can uh, have a dissociation between the two vegetative states patients are open eyes open sorry and uh, they show no signs of consciousness at all you can also have this transiently in sleepwalking or seizures patients in minimally conscious states they also have eyes open. They show some signs that are non-reflexive. They show some uh, meaningful behaviors. Basic, for example, they can follow you, uh, you when you walk around, or they can even laugh to jokes, but they can't communicate. And then locked-in syndrome patients, they are fully conscious. They can communicate with eye movements, but they are sometimes really difficult to detect. So the problem we have clinically with these patients is actually even between minimally conscious states and vegetative state patients, there's a lot of misdiagnosis. It's very difficult to recognize them. And also even in these patients that we call minimally conscious, most of the time they have very simple behaviors, and it's very difficult sometimes to interpret them like if they just fixate it you and do nothing else it's very difficult to know actually if there's someone behind the stair and of course there are very many uh, ethical implications for withdrawal of care and also for trying to communicate with them and so, you know, as a neurologist, at first I was, uh, you know, a medical student too. First, I was, I was trying to think that if you're actually unresponsive, it's very unlikely that you would be unconscious. But with Adrian Owen, we had designed this task uh, where we asked patients to imagine playing tennis in the functional MRI in case they cannot move, but that maybe they could answer us. 
And to my surprise, actually, many patients respond. Even in patients in vegetative state, they show no signs of consciousness behaviorally, but 15 to 20% do the task. And sometimes also patients don't do the task even if you know they are conscious. So that's kind of a warning sign saying, oh, consciousness and responsiveness are not the same. And we need some measures that are able to detect covert consciousness for these patients. And this kind of response to command is not sufficient because many patients could actually not show that and still be conscious. And so over the last, the, the, the last decade, two decades, like Marcello Massimini, Giulio Tononi have designed this uh, basically consciousness detector now that works really well. And I have Marcello and Giulio with these studies on coma patients as well. And this is actually, to me, a way to show you that these theories of consciousness that we are testing, not only they, are, uh, they have this kind of philosophical or neuroscientific relevance in general, but they can also lead to, to clinical tools that are useful. Yeah? So as Cyril mentioned, uh, integrated information theory states that if you look at your experience right now, uh, you see that it's both one integrated, but also it's differentiated. There are many contents in there, and you need a system that is both integrated and differentiated to support it. And so if you test that with TMS, basically you would zap the brain with a magnetic uh, pulse, and you see how the brain resonates. And it, the prediction is like, if you're unconscious, either integration is lost, so it's kind of a modular system, or like there's no differentiation, so a big homogeneous system. But if you're conscious, if it's both integrated and differentiated, you have a complex response. So then you have a practical thing to look at in brain activity to see if these predictions are verified and also develop a, a potential marker for consciousness that we want to apply to coma patients to try to see really, uh, is there someone in there or not, potentially. But first, we need to validate the measures, right? We need to validate the measures in uh, people that can tell us, in patients also that can tell us if they are conscious or not. So first, we did a validation study on the many different states I'll show you. And then from there, we went to uh, see what's going on is in these patients that cannot communicate. So validation and calibration of the measure in a benchmark population that can report, and then going to patients then. So this has been again a work over the last decade, and it, it is a remarkable finding that we have that the TMSCG, that complexity measure I mentioned to you, that combination of integration and differentiation, really works super well. So in blue here, you have all the states where uh, people say they were not, not there, they were unconscious. And then on, uh, in green, the unresponsive but conscious states, and in uh, red, uh, a series of healthy volunteers and then patients that were also able to say they were there. And you see that we can draw a cutoff that is actually showing a specificity and sensitivity of 100% to show that you know, people can be there or not. So basically you have a consciousness detector that has unequaled accuracy. Typically it's like 70% you get here. You actually get a strong tool to then go to patients who cannot communicate. You know, that's kind of a, a strong scientific basis to say if these patients are conscious or not. So then we went to apply this in patients in minimally conscious state and vegetative state. What do you find there? The data are quite interesting for different in different ways. So uh, the, the minimally conscious patients, the one that cannot communicate, but they, sh they show these kind of non-reflexive behaviors, uh, they are in red. And the vegetative state patients are more on the, on the right side. What you find is actually that with these complexity measures, a majority of patients in vegetative state are predicted to be unconscious, like it would be deep sleep or anesthesia in the brain function, even if they have their eyes open. But about like 20% of them are predicted to be conscious, which is the same number about that that we got with the, with the tennis paradigm. Yeah? So you have two different lines of evidence showing you that even if you have no signs of consciousness, about a fifth of patients are there. But then in minimally conscious state, it's also quite interesting because even if the patient showed really simple behaviors most of the time, yeah, a little response to command, a little tracking, not something very complex, but just these purposeful, meaningful behaviors are actually highly predictive for consciousness to be there. In 95%, TMS tells you patients were there. Okay? And again, it's not any data because you have to take this seriously because of the fact that the validation we had in the other states was so good. Yeah? So it's a strong inference to say that these patients in minimally conscious state that show these simple but you know, non-reflexive behaviors are actually conscious. 
And if you kind of reflect then further about it, that's kind of what I wanted to, to do with this data, is showing you kind of new findings, but also kind of trying to piece them with some newer findings also that are present in the sense of consciousness, some controversies, you know, and some questions that I think need to uh, be better answered so we can piece the whole picture together. Because some of you might know, there has been a ton of studies in the last you know, two decades that suggested that you can do so many things unconsciously, behaviorally, that behavior is actually more like uh, kind of unconscious for many things, maybe some complex task, you know, like you, you need consciousness for it. But this doesn't really fit that picture, that clinical picture saying even with simple behaviors, consciousness is actually there. And actually, if you don't have behaviors at all, you're really unlikely to be unconscious, but if you have this kind of behaviors, you know, consciousness is, is, is required for it in, in a way. Yeah, so I think it's very interesting because it's still, you know, a matter of ongoing uh, research, but there are newer data, newer ways to assess the links between consciousness and behavior, and actually also things that we might have, you know, we, we, we should maybe have thought about it before, but verifying that the way we ask questions to subjects is actually matching their experience. So the, a, a newer scale, like the perceptual awareness scale, actually has been designed to verify that the participants said, yeah, this is actually reflecting the changes in my experience I have. If you ask the subjects to design their own scale, you see that actually consciousness is not all or none. So it's not that you see something or you don't see it, but you have graded levels of consciousness. And if you use this scale, you can see that if you have no idea that the stimulus is on the screen, subjects are at change, yeah? And only if they have partial awareness of the stimulus, then they can be above, uh, uh, above chance for, for, for task performance. So that kind of you know, links better with the data and minimally conscious state. There are several studies of that kind, more to be done, but it's striking, you know, that we find this. And, and also to show you that kind of, Consciousness science is subject, the results you get is, is subject to the questions you ask. Patients with blind sight have been actually, so it's patients who have lesion in the visual cortex, and they say, I don't see a stimulus, yeah? Patients with blind sight have been taken as a, an example of how much you can do unconsciously. If you, instead of doing a binary scale, do you see something or not, you actually use a continuous perceptual awareness scale in these patients. Blind side disappears. There are three different groups showing this now. And you see, for example, uh, in red there, seen, not seen, you see the 12 uh, is like how much correct responses they had when they deny seeing. If you use the perceptual awareness scale, actually they don't have anything anymore. They are changed behaviorally when they say they don't see. So kind of showing you that emerging data are more to be done, but I think this is very important for the sense of consciousness to clarify, that depending on the, on the questions you ask, you get different, uh, different results. And importantly, the perceptual awareness scale is the one that the subjects tell you, oh, this is actually re reflecting how I feel. So, you know, do the data about minimally conscious state, the fact that all these kind of simple but uh, non-reflexive behaviors, um, they actually are closely associated with consciousness. Does that fit consciousness science? I would say more to be done. But there would be a good possibility that if we do these kind of revised studies in the field, we might see this, yeah? So another interesting aspect of another consequence that of these results that are quite interesting is that... Um, so TMSCG tells you minimally conscious state patients are 95% chance of being conscious. If you look at the population level, what are the areas that are preserved in minimally conscious state? What are the areas that, that are most predictive to be in that state versus the unconscious vegetative state? These are actually mostly in posterior network, mostly in sensory networks. And so that's, again, kind of a puzzling fact because there has been so much debate about, you know, the, like, the, or also like many theories, for example, said, said that the prefrontal cortex is so important for consciousness. And again, that's also something discussed in neuroscience, but that's, like, that's kind of pointing you to some interesting uh, contrast, yeah? And so, but then we kind of argued recently, you know, that, well, you actually have a lot of clinical data suggesting that the prefrontal cortex is not required for consciousness, because here is an example in humans, but also some monkey studies where, you know, where, where it was verified histologically that if you have bilateral complete resection of the bilateral frontal lobes, patients or monkeys stay conscious. So it looks that you don't need a prefrontal lobe uh, to be conscious. Another thing, another, you know, move in the, in the field to look at this conscious versus not contrast was also to actually look at what are the areas that are predictive to be conscious when you're unresponsive, which is basically what happens in minimally conscious state, yeah? So in minimally conscious state, 
they actually have these little behaviors, but they don't communicate, are basically unresponsive too. During sleep, you dream two thirds of the time, both during non-REM sleep and in REM sleep. You can actually contrast some periods where you, you are conscious versus not. If you do so, you're unresponsive, but sometimes you're conscious, sometimes you're not. If you do so, you find that the areas that are most predictive for consciousness are actually in the back of the brain. You have more slow waves in these areas if you are unconscious versus not. Same results we're getting during seizures. During seizures, focal seizures, patients sometimes stare, and then they tell you after I was conscious versus not. You can find that the frontal lobe is actually uh, showing slow waves even when you're uh, conscious but unresponsive, it's swallowing responsiveness. The back of the brain is following consciousness. And then many other data, I could like, spend an hour on this, but just showing it as emerging evidence that it's kind of challenging the, the, like the, the previous concepts, I'm nearly done, um, about the links between different brain areas and consciousness. Uh, some very causal ways to look at involvement of, of brain areas and consciousness is to stimulate the brain electrically, directly, like we do in, in a, you know, I do that as an epileptologist for clinical you know, care, brain mapping. And you see that if you stimulate the brain in different parts, the areas that show the most likely involvement in consciousness, showing different contents of consciousness, are actually in the back of, of the brain, involving all these sensory areas that we also see preserved in many reconscious state. Yeah? So these, I think, is very interesting. One, because, you know, it's uh, interesting new findings that challenge like the, the, the views we had before about the links of, for example, frontal parietal networks and consciousness and, and all that. But also, you know, understanding these data better is really important clinically because we really want to understand what's going on in these patients that kind of communicate and try to help them. Yeah? Also, that's something theories of consciousness need to explain, this contrast between these different parts of the brain and this, this kind of different data about some areas being more involved in conscious content or not. That's something we also need to explain. As much as we need to explain other findings that are very well known, like why is the cortex, the cortical thalamic system involved in consciousness and not the cerebellum? It might seem obvious to you, but it might, it's actually not so obvious why if uh, you look at it into detail. So if someone has you know, a lesion in the cerebellum and it's removed surgically, there's no change in consciousness. You're clumsy, but you're the same person. But if you look at it, the cerebellum has four times more neurons than the cortex. It's highly connected to it. It's involved in many cognitive processes. So there's really something to explain there. Um, but also, one more thing that we really, need to, we really need to push if we want to help these patients and also treat them is understanding better like the links between the brain and the contents of consciousness. We want to know what does it feel like to be a patient in a minimally conscious state. Ethically, it's very important to know. Are they aware? Are they self-aware? Do they hear me? What kind of contents do they have? And so there is also more and more work now trying to piece up the clinical data with the neuroimaging data, but also some, uh, some theoretical work to try to link better and in, uh, in, uh, you know, also some experiments we can test, like the, 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 the link between consciousness and, and conscious contents in some parts of the brain. So why do specific experiences feel the way they do, like space feel extended, the time feeling flowing, the objects, the colors? These are also uh, some aspects that the theory needs to address. And so I won't have time to discuss this, but in, in integrated information theory, we had a lot of work in the last few years characterizing, you know, what are likely the mechanisms for spatial extendedness uh, and, and, and the link with the brain. And so basically the prediction is that um, these spatial experiences that we have in the visual domain, in the body domain, you know, prerequisite or so forth, like an empty canvas on, the rest, the, the, on which the rest is, is painted, if you wish, are actually likely related to this kind of pyramidal, uh, pyramid of grids, this kind of grid-like architectures we have in the, in the back of the brain, like retinotopic, somatotopic networks. Um, and this is actually one of the, the predictions we're testing with the intrepid uh, framework. But then more work to be done about the other contents, and again, like comparing these theories as we do with uh, the Templeton um, you know, projects is, is really essential because then we can really try to pinpoint what are the causal links between you know, brain architecture in different parts of the brain and the contents of consciousness. It's important neuroscientifically, but also it's really essential for us to understand so we can infer you know, what it feels like to be this particular patient that com cannot communicate in front of my eyes and how, how can I help them. Yeah? So thank you.
Thank you, Melanie. Um, thanks to all the speakers. I'd like to invite all the speakers on the stage so that we can open the debate. And I would also like to invite the public to pose questions. So we're a bit uh, back and 15 minutes late, but I think we, there's, it's important to ask questions in this moment. And then we'll also have drinks in which we have the chance to ask more questions to the speakers. Is there anyone who would like to start? Jacob? Thanks. So you're all quite optimistic about the scientific explanation of consciousness. So I'm going to push back a little bit from the point of view of philosophy. And it's a, it's a new thought experiment that I just invented. It's called the, the phenomenal choice. Um, so imagine that in one hand I have a cute little bunny rabbit. And in the other hand, I've got this robot that I've created. It has the same behavioral repertoire as the rabbit. Input-output function is the same. Um, and Neil, it, I can match all the phenomenology with the underlying predictive coding stuff, active infant stuff. Andy, I can, I can uh, do all the kind of affordance-consuming, action-oriented stuff that the rabbit can in my little robot. All the interception. All the interception is there. Melanie, it has exactly the same integrated information, my little robot, as the, as the bunny rabbit. Surreal, it does all the predictive coding. Now the evil uh, scientist has caught me and is saying, you have to squash one of these two things with a big rock. And so the question to all, all four of you is, which, which of the two are you going to squash? Is it going to be the little cute bunny rabbit? <laughs> well, I quite like rabbits stew, so, you know. Okay. Is it on? Yeah, I mean, I quite like rabbit stew, so I'd, I'd get, get the rabbit and then eat it. I'm not going to eat the robot. Um, no, it's a good, it's a good question, because I think it, it gets at... Uh, there's a tendency... These judgments we make about whether other creatures or indeed patients are conscious... It's very hard to get out of our projection of anthropocentrism, anthropomorphism. Like, if things that seem similar to us, you know, or fluffy, you know, we tend to think are conscious. And, and there's really not a very... I mean, there's some logic to it, because humans are conscious, so knowing nothing else, things that are more similar to humans may be more similar, likely to be conscious. But otherwise, it's not a very principled way of doing it. Um, so there needs to be some other principled basis, and I think we all have slightly different ones. You're asking a lot of this robotic rabbit to do all the different things. And I think you're asking too much. I think it, will, it would basically be a rabbit if it had all the things that you say that it does. All the interoception, my other criterion, but is it also alive? You know, that interoception doesn't just stop somewhere at which the, it no longer matters what it's made out of. You know, the, the imperative for control and regulation goes right down to individual cells. So unless it's alive too, then I don't think it would it would count, and I would still, even though I like rabbit stew, I would still destroy the, uh, the robot. As a doctor, I would also say maybe I would smash the one that is easiest to repair, and I would bet you the robot would be. Yeah, so. yeah I think you need to change the thought experiment a little bit and make the robot more complicated than the animal, so that, as it were, the robot's got all the same things that we say are important going on, um, the animal, maybe the animal's a worm or something, and it's got some of them going on, not all the rest. Then I choose, under those conditions, I choose a robot. But the way you set it up, I'm certainly going to, um, I'm certainly going to um, choose the living thing. And, and I think there's something to be said back to you about life matters, because once you go right down to the level of the cell and stuff it's made of, I think Jakob can say the same thing again. You just create something like that, but not out of living stuff. I don't see any reason why that's impossible. So to do it right, you would have to say, yeah, let's do all of that. So we'll have this sort of input-output done as far down as you think it matters. And then mm. then you... Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would request time to, to study the real rabbit and the robot rabbit and right. see how good the, uh, the simulacrum or the, the product is. Um, I predict that at some point we'll, we'll discover differences in the, in the long-term ethology of uh, the robot rabbit. Um, 
if you say, well, you know, yeah, like, like can the rabbit improvise, for instance? Can it can it do more uh, of spontaneous behaviors that make sense in the ecology of the animal? Um, if so, then yeah, there is in the end, in the long term, no distinction between the robot and the, and the real rabbit. Um, so then it doesn't matter basically what we squash. Uh, but yeah, I, I, yeah. So I would squash uh, the frog uh, instead of the rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> so does it only matter what the rabbit or the robot rabbit does, or also how it's made? Does the architecture, computational architecture, matter to give rise to consciousness or not? I, I assume that the way that was set up, it had the same computational architecture. Yeah. So you cannot like test theories of consciousness or like have you know, really good data, but robots, like we cannot be, as I think you mentioned, or someone of, of you mentioned, if they say, I'm happy, we have no good reasons to trust them. So what we're doing also with the project here is we're actually testing theories of consciousness in humans and or like in monkeys sometimes or animals close to us. And then, then when we have good understanding of the mechanisms, and all like also good marker like TMSC gene brain similars to us like then then we can infer you know in difficult situations if consciousness would be there or not in one kind this is kind of the goal of theories of consciousness is try to be as general as possible so we can have more general tool to infer that but also scientifically right now we all would agree we don't we don't know we can't make this kind of inferences yet Thank you for the good uh, talk. It was very interesting. And I want to jump in. At back. <laughs> and I want to jump in from the moment the, the mosaic is mentioned. And I was wondering um, if you're talking about mosaic, um, you can start, for instance, researching um, swarms, especially, especially bees. For instance, when each bee has its own task, you soldier bee, whatever kind of different kind of bees. But the whole collection together needs to communicate and form something like a collective brain. And as you described it with the mosaic, you do the same thing with the brain. There is no explicit point mentioned how the mosaics are communicating. And in a swarm, you should find that explicit communication. So is it helpful in research to find out about consciousness not for each individual, but for the whole swarm? Um, I, I think you could try and apply the same picture to whole swarms, maybe to ant colonies, maybe to termite colonies, maybe to, to bees. Um, and I suppose that we can ask that question of all of these theories, you know, could there be, could there be enough sort of um, inward looking prediction going on that is kind of swarm centred um, and kind of outward looking perception of, of, of you know, uh, what matters to the whole swarm. I, there's no reason in principle, I think, why not? Um, maybe you could apply IIT to a whole swarm. Um. It's a long story, but for, you know, for IIT, there are different properties of conscious experience that needs to be accounted for in terms of, like, what kind of physical system and what kind of spatial temporal grain it can have, yeah? What kind of physical system can uh, support it or not? Is, and, you know, there's also something to explain about the fact that not, not every part of the brain, as I mentioned, seems to be involved. Um, like the cerebellum, for example, versus the cortex. It seems to be that the brain is more important than different parts of our body. So there seems to be, you know, an association between so, some physical substrates and, and consciousness. And there seems to be a border, if you want, to our consciousness. We can test, you know, predictions about consciousness and consciousness science in humans. We can't really, you know, test it in groups or, you know, on the internet. This is not something where we can really empirically um, address the question, but we can validate different theories of consciousness and they will have different implications about the place of consciousness in nature and what can be conscious or not. In integrated information theory, we say that consciousness has borders and is only one, the one we have, yeah? So if I'm conscious, 
then it means that the group of people who, who I am part are kind of competing with that, and I would be conscious and not the group. But these are like levels of speculations and uh, not the level of experiments, you know. And we need more confidence in dif the different theories in order to trust what they infer in this kind of complex kind of topics and like unusual situations we cannot test in general. I think that um, uh, the honeybee swarm is, is interesting because it sort of forces us out of the comfort zone to think of also neurons um, uh, having to communicate but not necessarily very close to each other in uh, an anatomical confinement of the brain. Uh, but um, yeah, in, in terms of predictive processing, we, uh, I think we, we have to think more in terms of uh, computational operations that the brain has to do um, that could not take place so easily in a swarm of honeybees. Um, that is the, the coding of errors, the coding of representations uh, that require very particular interactions between neurons. Uh, and they would not so be easily implemented by, by swarms or or anything, so the danger is a bit to slide into panpsychism and attribute consciousness to too many things that have no other ways of, of showing that, of showing evidence for it. Um, so I think there's also a risk in uh, easily taking this too far. Uh, I, I kind of agree, I think there's a very nice intuition though there. There's, a, there's an intuition in a, in a swarm of bees or where I live in Brighton, you often see these, these flocks of, of starlings that, that um, roost on the ruins of the old pier and they, they, the flock seems to have like a, a whole that's more than the sum of its parts it has an autonomy and an identity yet there's no mystery that it is just the cre that they're just birds flying around you know, there's nothing that is the flock that's more than the sum of it and when we think about consciousness there's sort of some similar part whole thing going on right we have 86 billion neurons three quarters of which don't matter um, and, but we have one conscious experience that seems to be unified and integrated, and, and this, this is you know, a point that uh, Melanie's theory, IIT, Julio's theory, makes very clear. So by trying to capture that intuition, understand, measure it, in a sense measure, come up with a, a measure that tells us like, how much of this emergent stuff is going on in a non-spooky way, just that picks out things that we agree that's emergent. You know, we can use those kinds of tools to see if we can explain properties of consciousness, like the degree to which it seems unified and, and integrated. And that's, that's one of the things we're doing in my group, actually. We try and build mathematical measures that track emergence and then generalize them and apply them to as many different systems as we can. So, which is very different from saying the, the, the swarm or the flock of birds is conscious. But it's just like, yeah, that's an interesting property that that system has that might be very relevant for an understanding of this other problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my question actually adds on to this idea of the, the flock or, or the swarm. And I was wondering if you could, I guess more theoretically, um, apply the same logic to politics and whether you think there's a there's room for interdisciplinary, um, you know, to to explain threat and polarization and people kind of building on top of each other's perceptions that don't always match. If you can explain broader social um, phenomenon like that through the study of consciousness as well. Maybe I'll start with this one very quickly because I, th I think there's something really important there. And it's not that you, know, you can sort of solve political issues by throwing consciousness science at them at all, no. But um, polarization is an increasingly worrying trend. And we're very familiar with the idea already of, so of sort of social media echo chambers, media echo chambers. We, we listen to the news that tells us the news that we want to hear, and then it makes it increasingly difficult to even know that other news is going on. Um, but what's less appreciated is this idea that, that we also live in perceptual echo chambers. You know, we see the world literally differently from each other. This is what I was sort of talking about at the end with the perception census. But this is really tricky because it doesn't seem like that to us, right? It seems like we see the world as it really is, which is why things like the dress are so, so interesting and we're so popular because they reveal fractures in that assumption. 
Um, but then we go back and we forget. And if, we, if it seems to us that we see the world really, as it really is, it's very, very hard to appreciate that others might literally see it differently. So I think there's actually a wedge you can take here. You can, by having people recognize that their perceptual experience, their literal perceptual experience is a construction and that it's specific to them, that has, it's overlapped, it's not totally unique, but it's specific to them. You know, that can cultivate a kind of humility about the way you see the world. And that humility about the way we perceptually experience the world can then very optimistically ramify into a humility about the beliefs that we hold about the world too. So, you know, maybe give people some of these, show them the dress and get them to... But th th there's, there's one very quick story. There was like a, um, a summit between the leader of Sudan and the rebel leader in South Sudan a few years ago. And they went to a summit in the Vatican. And for the first evening, they didn't say anything. They just had dinner in silence. Why did they do this? I have no idea. I wasn't there. But what I like to think is they did this so they could agree about their perceptions. And once they had a platform for agreeing about what was going on, maybe they could start talking. So I do think there are lessons both for understanding the origin and trajectory of polarization, but perhaps also for doing something about it. Another thing is, you know, if we can understand better, um, starting from the, start, the science of consciousness, also like which conditions lead us to be more open to others, more perceptive of actually the world around us without coloring it with ourselves, you know, like our biases then we could also try to find some ways to improve it, you know, also to kind of improve our way to relate to each other and gain insight on how to improve our society as well, yeah? So part of it are clinical implications, but also implications for all of us and for well-being and for how we relate to each other, yeah. Uh, just a very quick pick up on that. I think another aspect of it is that the way that we structure our worlds, our physical and digital worlds, can be shown to make a huge difference to these sorts of information processing paradigms. So in a way, I'm sort of, the way my world is structured is kind of building in an awful lot of stuff about how I should attend to the world, what's important, where should I attend? Uh, and you can see that going on in, in lots of domains. And, and in a way, that is sort of like the, the world is doing the kind of processing that when it goes on in, in, in the brain is one of the things that gives experience the shape it does. So I think we need to be very careful about the worlds we build because actually the way that we experience things and the way that we think about things are, are hugely impacted by that, maybe even constituted by it. So, yeah, I think it's, it's good to think about the world as just not this distinct arena from the brain, but in a way just, it's just kind of doing more of the same, in some ways, at least. Mm. Yeah, I <clears throat> would not take it that far, but um, one interesting analogy might be um, that uh, uh, the brain is, of course, composed of many areas, and, and we, we understand particularly what happens in a single area. Um, and we call those smaller networks. Um, there, there is a science emerging that talks about networks of networks, so um, also called it meta networks or hyper networks. Uh, and that is the study also of, um, uh, for instance, power, uh, power grid networks and, and how societies operate in sharing information. Uh, and th there is an analogy to, to the brain indeed. So uh, you could have failures in those networks and at some point you get a catastrophic breakdown of, of networks. Um, and that I think has particular analogies to, to political uh, crises um, as um, yeah, also might happen in the, in the Ukraine, uh, etc. Um, so yeah, there, there's an interesting commonality, but also uh, uh, I think differences in in the way that the brain uh, does it. Yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, hi, um, my question is kind of opposite to the swarm of bees question. Um, so if I understand it correctly, you all think that each person has one consciousness. But then what if you have a split brain patient, for example, um, and there's also, for example, people with dissociative identity disorder who claim to have multiple consciousnesses at the same time. Um, how do you think about that? I'll answer about the split brains. There's, you know, a lot of studies have been done in uh, split brain patients showing that if they are fully split, typically like with the two-thirds of the 
uh, the posterior brain actually they just don't even know that there are two individuals there. Like the left brain in particular, who is able to speak, is going to kind of completely ignore um, that there's an, another consciousness that it's like anosognosia. They just don't know something is missing. It's so the same with patients with strokes. A lot of them, if it's like large cortical strokes, they just don't even know they have a deficit. Yeah. So, and there you would have two people in the same brain, but they would, would kind of not know there's someone else. Really. They would only feel they're part. Um, and typically what happens is that they can communicate at some point, they communicate with like the shoulders, like cross queuing and things, but it's not that you would have one person having two consciousnesses in that sense, I would say. You can, there are also some studies suggesting that they have different personalities. One wants to be like a pilot, the other one a teacher or something, you know? So uh, it's, it's something more intriguing for the fact that indeed you can have one body and two person uh, uh, inhabiting it in these kind of extreme circumstances, I would say. Well, I would add to that. I don't know. Do you know you're sitting next to one of the leading split brain researchers, um, in, in certainly in the Netherlands, probably in the world? So, Jai Pinto, I've, I've worked, we worked together a little bit on this too, actually, and on, on other things. And I mean, I don't want to, well, I'm going to put some words in Yaya's mouth and then he'll explain why I'm wrong. But in the recent research that, that he's been doing and, and his colleagues, you know, they, it does tend to suggest that there's less separation between the two sort of sides of a split brain than one might think you know there's a lot that so for instance split brain people are able to actually you know look identify where visual stimuli appear wherever they appear but it's only certain things that they can't do so it's it may be more integration than, than we used to think is going on so it's a very complex story and and the issue one of the issues is now it's because of in, improvements in medicine right and in treatment of epilepsy the split brain operation is very, very rarely done. And it's certainly very rarely done where it's complete. So we have all these super interesting stories from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, but we don't have um, really ways of going back to that for, for good reasons for the patients. So there's a little bit of historical mystery about this. So actually, I was hanging out with um, Gazaniga, who was one of the early split brain researchers who... Who'd had those patients, as it were, and he said to me that he can follow those patients now and that you wouldn't be able to spot that there was much had been done to them, and it's because, at least this is what he thinks, they've learned to use the world and actions in the world to kind of cross-communicate information in all of these ways, so they've kind of sort of effected an interesting kind of repair by learning how to use the environment and actions to do a lot of the work that was previously being done by the corpus callosum. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, again, that speaks to, to how we can kind of change the distributions between brain and world and yet maybe preserve some of the overall functionality. Hello. Um, um, so I wanted to ask a little bit about maybe AI and what do you think about the um, relations and discussions of consciousness in AI? And more specifically, I was wondering, so we have Turing tests for various um, things like to be able to say whether what the agent we're interacting with is intelligent or human. So for the test of consciousness, what kinds of things would you um, suggest that we should look at because in the brain we can look at some activations and neural networks we also have um, studies looking into the activations in the like artificial neural networks but would that be enough or um, how should we go about that so I'll, I'll take this first it's a really I think it's a good question so, and I was actually at a panel about a month ago in Amsterdam remotely for the World AI Summit where we had a, a whole session on on um, hype and prospects for sort of machine consciousness and some of you might know recently there was this big furore about this this Google engineer called Blake Lemoine who claimed that his language model called Lambda was was conscious and what was really astonishing about two things were astonishing about this first thing it was basically the only thing people in the AI community agreed on was that he was talking absolute rubbish and they tend to disagree about everything else <laughs> and the second thing was how much 
media time it got. You know, it really, it really took over. People find this a very alluring thing to, to, to consider because it puts people at this kind of level of Promethean achievement that they're creating machines in their own image that have sentience. And for these tech bro nutters, they think this is really you know, empowering to feel themselves pivotal at this moment of historical transition. So it all comes from an overinflated ego, I think. Um, you know, the, the Lambda, these language models, they're just, they're, all they do is they just, they're big statistical pattern recognition things with, a, with some learning and prediction. Oh, the other thing that the fuss about it means that people don't, they don't focus on how good these things actually are. You know, the improvement in AI and language models, all these sort of things, have been phenomenal over the last few years. And that gets lost in this kind of vapid debate about whether they actually feel anything, which they just do not. Um, so I think there's, there's, yeah, there's, a, there's many problems here. Why don't I think that they're conscious? Well, you can take each theory and make an inference about it, but I very much doubt any of our theories would allocate consciousness to any AI system um, right now. Right now. The, but the prospects for it, you know, maybe it will happen, and it, it, but what, we, what will happen, and this gets to your other question, is we're, ve we're getting close to machines that will give us the convincing impression that they are conscious. And in the virtual world, with deep fakes and language models, we're almost there. Lambda didn't cut it, because you could ask Lambda what makes you happy, and it said friends and family. It doesn't have any bloody friends and family. It's, it's still very easy to catch out. But the next language model, you know, Lambda 6.0 or GPT-23, might do. But then we're going to live in a very, very difficult situation, because we will be living in a world where we will know that we can't tell the difference between real, sentient, aware, uh, fellow humans and things that give us the strong impression that they are conscious. And just as we, when we know certain visual illusions are illusions, we still see the illusions, right? We can't unexperience the illusions. And the same thing might be true. Even if we know it's just a, a sort of statistical pattern recognition thing, we might still have the unavoidable impression that the thing is conscious. Finally, we should not even be trying to build conscious machines, for Christ's sake, because why? We're just creating things that could have the potential to suffer, and we might not even recognize it. It's an ethical runaway catastrophe. Don't even think about it. But we, we, need, to, we, need, we need to think about it a bit to make sure that we don't do it by accident. And the test, the test that matters is not the Turing test, but the Garland test. How many people have seen Ex Machina? So the Garland, a few of you, everyone go watch it. It's a brilliant film. The Garland test, Alex Garland, he says, talks about the Turing test. There's a robot, and the robot is a beautiful woman who looks to be conscious. And so the question is, for the programmer guy, he's there to try and figure out whether the robot called Ava really is conscious or not. And then in explaining this, eventually, one of the characters of the movie says, says you know about the Turing test. The Turing test is, is a machine intelligent, or do you feel that which, which machine is a human, and which machine is a, sorry, which of two things is a human or a machine? Um, the Garland test is subtly different. The Garland test says the real thing is to show you that X is a machine and see if you still feel it has consciousness. So this is a beautiful piece of film dialogue that's actually become now a piece of philosophy of mind called the Garland test. Uh, it's, it's what does it take for a machine to give you the impression that it is conscious. This is not a test of whether it actually is conscious. It's a test of what it takes for a human being to be convinced of that. And, but that's the question we are soon going to face. I think we need a never a better test. We need to make progress in consciousness science yeah. and actually understand what it takes to be conscious and of what. And then we can answer better, because still judging if it's a machine and it's conscious is still not very objective as a way to decide what we do with them, you know, if they suffer or not. All these are the same kind of inferences that we try to make from patients, but this has relevance for AI and ethical approaches to them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I uh, agree that um, the deep learners, uh, the deep learning networks of AI, uh, uh, don't have don't have consciousness. They they uh, are, are good pattern recognizers. They they give amazing uh, image captions, uh, like uh, a woman uh, throwing a frisbee in a park or so, but uh, uh, probing the uh, machines uh, yields nothing in the way of yeah, what it is to experience being in a park or what a park is or or the grass lawn. Um, uh, the, the machines can be easily fooled, um, 
by, by giving alternate patterns uh, or making slight modifications. Um, so in that sense, there's a long way to go. The, the deep learners basically have no, no inference, no, no representation building, but just uh, feed forward way of um, categorizing things. Um, and yeah, what would work, I think, indeed, uh, is, is, is this more implementation in robotics, so that, that we uh, get to see machines that might be able to um, uh, perform reasonable behaviors on, on the long term, like uh, you see in, in, in orcas, you know, that orcas are able to um, socially hunt for, for seals, for instance, know how to um, uh, make them yeah, fall off an ice shelf by, by complicated tail flips, etc. So a lot of behavior that requires visuospatial knowledge and integration um, uh, deliberations that where, where you say, well, that, that can typically not be done without consciousness. Um, and, and improvisation uh, behavior. So, in a way, in a way that that links to the to the Garland test. In, in sort of, the robots will have to convince us that um, um, they, they somehow feel and experience something. And, uh, but, but yeah, even even now we have uh, killer drones, and um, uh, there is already discussion of yeah w whether they could be sentient given all the sensors they have and all the complicated autonomous decisions that they might make. So uh, it's really a point where we have to say to, to set rules of like how, how far the machines should be able to go. Um. So I agree with everything that all of my fellow commentators have just said, oh, but you. at the same time, <laughs> wow. but at wow. the same time, I'm just not sure that some of these questions will actually have answers. I think there could be some future robot well, we want to ask that question, is that really conscious or not? But maybe we shouldn't ask it, because that's still slightly the wrong question. We should be asking, you know, what can it do? What kind of information processing is going on? How much bodily awareness has it got? Um, you can, you know, I'm not sure, for example, that with the worm, we're ever going to know whether we should say that the worm's conscious or not. Uh, no matter how much we do IIT, no matter how much we do predictive processing, you know, we've, we've got this word, it names something in us that has a constellation of properties, and it just could break down in, in, in many ways. So I, I don't know, I just feel that we shouldn't, we shouldn't always think that these questions have yes, no answers. But you said in your slide you were optimistic about it. I, I think that is optimism. That's, that's really optimistic <laughs> about our relations with robots and other creatures and everything, because we give them their due for all of the bits that they've got. <laughs> as it were. Um, but, I, but I agree, you know, one day we will have a better understanding of how bits come together to give us all of these cool things that give dogs and cats and frogs and us the ability to do and sometimes to say the cool things that we do and sometimes say. And when we do understand that, we'll have a, a, a grip on a kind of core set of properties that probably hang together in an interesting way. Um, but just don't expect yes, no answers. Just one very, very quick last thing on this, because I forgot that the, the, the question is also predicated often on people assuming that intelligence and consciousness are very, very closely related, which is another, I think, aspect of this human exceptionalism that we have. You know, we think we're smart and we think we know we're conscious, so we think the two go together. And to think that consciousness just sort of happens as you ramp up the intelligence is just, I think, confusing these two different concepts in a way that's driven by our presumed specialness in the world. And different theories will have different implications about that, but for example, IIT says that you can have any function, even very complex ones, performed by a network that would be unconscious. And so we really need to see how it's built, and like from first principle understand consciousness in the situations we can test like humans to infer that. We have to move to the drinks because we are really right. late. But I'd like to thank the speakers for giving these fantastic talks and for also for showing us how much we don't know, why it's important to know about consciousness practically, and also, and I think we have a varied audience here, that all the disciplines really matter. We have to talk between philosophers, neuroscientists, clinical scientists, physicists, all the disciplines really need to come together if we want to understand consciousness. And just one last question to all of you. Why did you start, decide to study consciousness? Two words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, understanding people, <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> I never wanted to study consciousness. <laughs>
I think trying to improve well-being, helping others, yeah. Because it's there.